So thank you so much. You set me up brilliantly for <laughs> with your questions with what I'm what I'm gonna talk about. Um, so this is so I'm gonna talk about linked open data, but I'm going to give an entirely, I hope, non-technical presentation because I'm assuming that most of it, many, if not most, of the people in the room uh, don't uh, necessarily know a whole lot about uh, linked data. I know we've got one, and we've got a investment <laughs> person here, so I know we have at least one expert in the room. Um, but I thought what I would try to do, because the session is meant to be about uh, open access and open data, is I would try to look at how uh, the use of linked data has contributed to the openness of the Ariadne project from a non-technical standpoint. So, uh, and I also wasn't entirely sure how much kind of background about the Ariadne project was going to be uh, presented uh, previously. So I thought what I would do is, is set out, so this is kind of what Ariadne was meant to be at its core. And the way that uh, linked data really uh, helps with this is if you look at the, par the part of this that talks about existing archaeological data infrastructures. So how do we use things that are already existing? How do we repurpose them in uh, productive ways? Is it on? Okay. Stop. I'll just yell. Um, so, so there are several different uh, objectives within Ariadne, uh, but this is the key objective, I think, when it comes to looking at linked data and openness. So looking at uh, uh, comparison, reuse, and integration, all things that we're very interested in with linked data. And Ariadne has uh, uh, 17 different work packages, of which six are uh, specifically to do with trying to do new research. So the obvious work package that's most relevant for linked data is, of course, linking archaeological data. But I would like to say that there are, uh, that linked data actually permeates all of these work packages to some degree. Uh, certainly with, within addressing complexity, which is run by our partners at Forth. Um, so for those of you who are uh, familiar with the CDOC CRM, uh, they're doing lots of work with that. Um, and certainly data mining and natural language processing, which allows, which isn't linked data, but is often used in conjunction with linked data to uh, extract more information from things like gray literature that can then be used with linked data. But it really does permeate the entirety of the project. So I thought what I would do is come up with three kind of key questions or uh, that to, to, to frame the discussion. So uh, how does working with linked data make the Ariadne project more open? Uh, what linked data approaches are used by Ariadne, and I'm only going to talk about two sort of core approaches, and I'm really glad that uh, the Numisma example has just come up, because there are lots of different things that we're trying and lots of experiments, so this is by no mean a, means a comprehensive, uh, comprehensive list, just a couple of things. And then uh, I was sort of reflecting, because we're now in the final months of the project, what are the lessons that we've potentially learned? What would we do? Uh, what, would, what do we need to do next? I guess to make data more open. So, uh, so looking at the first question. So, how does working with linked data make the Ariadne project more open? Well, just a little bit of background, non-technical background about what linked data can do. Uh, it is a way to make data more easily processable about machines. Make thing, makes things more automated. Um, it's a way to make heterogeneous stable, uh, data more interoperable and searchable uh, by linking with other data and mapping it with uh, things like, well, authoritative vocabularies and mappings between vocabularies. And when I say vocabularies, that's kind of a loose term for thesauri, vocabularies, ontologies. These are very different things, but we, we use them interchangeably, but they have very different levels of complexity. Um, and it's a way to potentially infer new information about uh, from existing data. So all things that the Ariadne project very much is trying to do. But uh, just because you're using linked data, that doesn't mean that your data is open. And you see this acronym, uh, LOD, law, linked open data. Uh, linked data, it's a technical solution. Um, it, it's not something that is inherently open in and of itself. Uh, it's a way of breaking down data silos, and I won't go into a discussion of, of the semantic web, but it's basically a way of creating a web of data instead of a, a web of documents. Uh, 
um, the data still has to fundamentally be open and accessible, and that's done through things like open licensing and open dissemination. So this is the Ariadne portal, a screenshot of the Ariadne portal, which, is, which was officially launched um, back at the CAA conference in Oslo a few months ago. This is what it looks like. Um, it's, it's an extremely simple interface, which, is, uh, which I think is great. Um, you'll see that there's a keyword search, and then down at the bottom, we basically have a what, where, when browse function as well. So that's what it actually is. So in terms of what uh, a couple of key linked data approaches that are used within Ariadne, something, things that we're just, we were just talking about basically, so for what, we've chosen uh, to map subjects to the Getty Ar Architecture Thesaurus, which is a uh, controlled, uh, controlled thesaurus, controlled vocabulary. And then for when, uh, we have been contributing to and will be using uh, the periodio, something called periodo, uh, for time periods um, using a system that they call assertions. So what I think is really quite fascinating about what's happened here is that uh, people who work with linked data tend to have quite strong opinions about uh, whether to use a top-down approach where you're using some kind of controlled vocabulary and people are meant to basically map up to the same thing together in order to make their data interoperable. Um, so that's what the AAT does. Um, for period O, it uses a completely different bottom-up approach, basically taking a period assertions. So I say that this is the Bronze Age for this particular region, and why? Because I said so, because I'm an expert, basically. And what it does is build up layer after layer of these uh, assertions with attribution, to build a, a sort of a joint picture of what we think the Bronze Age is in a particular place uh, and what, those, what the dates potentially might be with that. So we're using a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach uh, together. And I don't know that that's been done before. Uh, so that really interesting that that's the very sort of pragmatic way that Ariadne chose to go with this. So uh, in terms of what... Uh, we actually did. So we went through and we manually, we had each of the partners, each of the data providing partners, uh, manually match their vocabulary concepts uh, to the AAT. And uh, we used the AAT as a mediating platform or a neutral spine to map concepts in people's national languages, as we were talking about just a minute ago. And in order to actually do that, our partners at the University of South Wales created a, a, a thesaurus mask mapping tool that allowed us to do this. And even though it was created for Ariadne, it is absolutely openly available for use outside of Ariadne, if people are interested in using it. Uh, it looks like this. Uh, the website is down at the bottom, slightly cut off. Um, and uh, also the code is uh, freely available on GitHub. If you want to take it and repurpose it, you're welcome to do that. It works very well. Um, the key thing about this is that you're not matching terms to terms. You're a human being, and you're matching concepts to concepts. And of course, you only have to do this once. Once you've done the matching, uh, you can reuse your uh, mapped vocabulary over and over however you want to. Um, and I don't know if you can see this, but the example here is apps. So we've got a source vocabulary from the UK. Um, we've got the uh, notes as to what the apps is. You can check and see and make sure you've got the right apps. Uh, and then you can look at the target vocabulary, which is the art and architecture thesaurus. You can read what they think an apps is, what the description is, and see if you agree. Uh, and then you can basically make a match. And because it's using something called uh, SCOS, you can choose what level of match it is, whether it's an exact match, whether it's not quite right, uh, how confident you are that it's really the right thing, uh, and start to build your vocabulary. So, um, basically, if you want a little bit more information about it, uh, it is, um, when it's doing the matching, it's pulling directly from the AAT or a variety of other vocabularies that are available uh, online through Sparkle endpoints. Um, it is, the AAT is already, has some multilinguality in it, uh, and you can do exports as well if you want to use it uh, for however it is you want to use it. 
And so this is what, so it doesn't do what Lisa wants and what I want yet, <laughs> but this is what it does do. So if you go and you type your term in, you will get a, so I started typing in B-R-O-O, so I wasn't quite sure how to spell brooch and what kind of brooch I necessarily wanted. Uh, so you can see that it's given me quite a few choices, and if I say that I want a, uh, a ring brooch, but actually I'm not entirely sure if I want a ring brooch. I want to know more about whether or not I agree that the ring brooch that they're pulling up for me is the ring brooch that I want. Uh, and if I, sorry, if I click on the little I at the end, it brings up this. So it tells me uh, what, the as the end user, not the person doing the mapping, but the actual end user. This is what I think a ring brooch is. This is where it came from. The broader term is brooches. Uh, these are the different languages that it's available in. And who did the mapping? So uh, invariably, the AES did the mapping. And you can see that we thought it was an exact match. We think that that and actually annular brooch are the exact same thing. So uh, if you then actually do a search on ring brooch, just so you can see a little bit of what the uh, portal does, uh, you'll get some different, it looks like we've got an excavation archive and we've got three uh, gray lit reports that have come up. And, and you can then click through to the one you want, from the one in Norfolk. And you can see what, uh, what's then returned for that individual report. And you can see that it's also returning uh, the AAT terms for the other things that are associated with that report. And so there are also necklaces and crematoria are associated with this file. So uh, moving on to uh, Periodo. Uh, so Periodo is a linked open data gazetteer for linking and visualizing data. That's its purpose. So it contains, uh, as I said, these scholarly definitions of, thing, of different archaeological periods and it allows things to be linked more easily. Uh, and as we know, uh, when is always linked with where in archaeology, which is why time is so incredibly difficult to deal with uh, with linked data. And But it's very transparent, so it allows users to, to, to see where period definitions overlap or diverge. So some of the issues that period O is trying to deal with, um, so Archaeologists, we use conceptual rather than quantitative language to refer to time. So we will say Bronze Age rather than particular dates, or we'll say dates in many different ways. <laughs> it's very, very problematic. And different people can use the same period terms to, re to refer to very different things. So if you're in one country, Bronze Age means something completely different than somewhere else. So the way that Period O has tried to approach this is they have uh, they document uh, definitions of periods by uh, authoritative research, uh, sources. So someone is asserting, that this is what I think this time period is, and then there is attribution. So you can see who it is that said that and whether you agree, decide if you agree or not. And it, it's interesting because it corresponds with traditional scholarly practice. This is the way that we're used to working. We want to know uh, who said so and whether we, we want to know if we believe them or not. So the way that Ariadne's been working with Periodo is uh, all of the content providing partners uh, were asked to submit their authoritative period terms uh, in their country or region in their national languages. These have then, and uh, Lisa facilitated all of this, um, these terms were then uh, submitted to Periodo and where they then made uh, linked data URIs, which are basically the linked data addresses that will be used persistently. Um, and then they were incorporated into the period of Gazetteer um, for use with uh, Ariadne, but they're there for anybody else's use now as well. So, And uh, even though it's meant to be machine readable because it's linked data, they have uh, fairly recently built uh, a, uh, um, an interface so that you can actually look at it. Um, so this is what the interface is. It's, it's quite simple. You can see it. So this is just the, the basic interface that you see, the periods, time ranges, and uh, ways of filtering. And I did a, a quick search. Basically, I said, I want to see what Bronze Age is. And I chose, uh, I want to see what Bronze Age is across Slovenia and Hungary. In their, I want to know what per terms they're using. And I want to know what time periods they consider to be the Bronze Age across those two countries. 
and this is what I got. So um, you've got uh, things in both languages, you've got potential dates, and unfortunately it's too pale to see here, but they have, there's actually a really nice chart so you can see where things typically fall, like where most people agree that the Bronze Age is. You can see a graphic of that. Um, so it's really, it's really nice. Unfortunately, I didn't do another slide actually showing you what the individual records are, but if I remember to do that, um, you would see that you can then look and say, oh, okay, I think, this is, I think this is the one I want, but I don't know, do I agree? And then you click on it, you see who provided it, and you can decide whether you agree or not. So, currently, uh, period of search is currently being implemented in the ARIAD portal, should be available in the next few months. Obviously, we're still working on things. Um, but as we have new associated partners added to Ariadne, for example, Lithuania, who became an associated <laughs> partner of the project yesterday at lunch, um, <laughs> will also be invited to submit their terms. And we want to just continue and continue to broaden coverage across Europe. So uh, very quickly, a couple of lessons that uh, I think we've learned, or at least I feel like I've learned. Uh, so how can we use linked data to make archaeological data more open. Um, I think linked data, it provides important tools for making archaeological data more open, but I think at this point uh, working together to support open practices is the real key. Um, it's what we need to do is get to the point where we are supporting more people just getting their data online, essentially, um, because it's taken years and years and years for some people to get to, these, get to this point where they're able to use linked data, they're able to uh, take advantage of, of the different initiatives that are happening, but my real concern is that there are a lot of people being left behind. So, uh, but what we're seeing is that archeologists are really starting to come under internal pressure within their own um, countries to try to uh, make their data available uh, for a variety of reasons. And if we can just get to that point, if we can help people, support people so that they can at least get their data open and accessible in some way, then they have the ability to potentially join us, become part of an infrastructure like area like FASTI. Um, all of those opportunities open up for them, I guess. So that's really it. I think we can make future. Awesome. Thank you. Okay.